Oh, hello there. I'm Bill Chan. I'm Nimic Kong. I'm Van Chan. In this class, I'll read to all of you. Chapter 6, Section 5 of the Picture of Jorian Gray. Ass. Ugh. The Picture of Jorian Gray. Oscar Wilder. Chapter 7, Section 5. After a little while, he held a handsome and drove home. For a few moments, he loitered upon the doorstep, looking round at the silent square with its blank, close shuttered windows and its staring blinds. The sky was pure opal now and the roofs of the houses glistened like silver against it. From some chimney opposite a thin wreath of smoke was rising. It called a violet ribbon through the night colored air in the huge gold Phoenician lantern. Spoil of some dude's burge that hung from the ceiling of the grate. Oak penalt hall of entrance Lights were still burning from three flickering jets. Thin blue petals of flame they seemed. Rent with white fire. He turned them out and... Having thrown his hat and cape on the table. Passed through the library towards the door of his bedroom. A large octagonal chamber on the ground floor that... In his newborn feeling for luxury... He had just had decorated for himself and hung with some curious renaissance tapestries that had been discovered stored in a dist attic at Selby Real. As he was turning the handle of the door, his eye fell upon the portrait Basil Howard had painted of him. He started back as if in surprise. Then he went on into his own room, looking somewhat puzzled. After he had taken the buttonhole out of his coat, he seemed to hesitate. Finally, he came back, went over to the picture, and examined it. In the dim arrested light that struggled through the cream coloured silk blinds, his face appeared to him to be a little changed. The expression looked different. One would have said that there was a touch of cruelty in the mouth. It was certainly strange. He turned round in. Walking to the window. Drew up the blind. The bright dawn flooded the room and swept the fantastic shadows into dusky corners. Where they lay shuddering. But the strange expression that he had noticed in the face of the portrait seemed to linger there, to be more intensified even. The covering ardent sunlight showed him the lines of cruelty round the mouth as clearly, as if he had been looking into a mirror after he had done some dreadful. And he winced and, taking up from the table an oval glass framed in ivory cupids, one of Lord Emmy's many presents to him glanced hurriedly into its polished depths. No line like that warped his red lips. What did it mean? He rubbed his eyes and came close to the picture and examined it again. There were no signs of any change when he looked into the actual painting. And yet there was no doubt that the whole expression had altered. It was not a mere offence of his own. The thing was horribly apparent. He threw himself into a chair and began to think. Suddenly there flashed across his mind what he had said in Basil Howard's studio that the day the picture had been finished. Yes. He remembered it perfectly. He had just a mad wish that he himself might remain young. And the portrait grew old that his own beauty might be untarnished. 
and the face on the canvas bear the burden of his passions and his sins. That the painted image might be seared with the lines of suffering and thought. And that he might keep all the delicate boom and loveliness of his just. Conscious boy out. Surely his wish had not been fulfilled. Such things were impossible. It seemed monstrous even to think of them. And it. It. There was the picture before him. With a touch of cruelty in the mouth. Cruelty. Had he been cruel? It was the girl's fault. Not his. He had dreamed of her as a great artist. Had given his love to her because he had thought her great. Then she had disappointed him. She had been shallow and unworthy. And uh, it. A feeling of infinite regret came over him. As he thought of her lying at his feet sobbing like a little child. He remembered with what callousness he had washed her. Why had he been made like that? Why had such all been given to him? But he had suffered also. During the three terrible hours that the play had lasted. He had lived centuries of pain. And upon and of torture. His life was well worth hers. She had marred him for a moment. If he had wounded her for an age. Besides. Women were better suited to bear sorrow than men. They lived on their emotions. They only thought of their emotions. When they took cleverest. It was merely to have someone with whom they could have scenes. Lord Henry had told him that. And Lord Henry knew what women were. Why should he trouble about Sybil Vane? She was nothing to him now. But the picture. What was he to say of that? It held the secret of his life. And told his story. It had taught him to love his own beauty. Would it teach him to love his own soul? Would he ever look at it again? No. It was merely an illusion wrought on the troubled senses. The horrible night that he had passed had left phantoms behind it. Suddenly there had flown upon his brain that tiny scarlet speck that makes men mad. The picture had not changed. It was early to think so. Yet it was watching him. With its beautiful marred face and its cruel smile. Its bright hair gleamed in the early sunlight. Its blue eyes met his own. A sense of infinite pity. Not for himself. But for the painted image of himself. Came over him. It had altered already. Woods or more. Its gold would wither into grey. Its red and white roses would die. For every sin that he committed, a stain would flack and wreck its fairness. But he would not sin. The picture changed more and changed. Would be to him the visible emblem of conscience. He would resist temptation. He would not see Lord Henry any more world than that. At any rate. Listen to those little poisonous theories that in Basil Howard's garden had first stirred within. In the passion for impossible things. He would go back to Sibylvain. Make her amends. Marry her. Try to do her again. Yes. It was his duty to do so. She must have suffered more than he had. Poor child. He had been selfish and cruel to her. The fascination that she had exercised over him would return. They would be happy together. His life with her would be beautiful and pure. 
he got up from his chair and drew a large screen right in front of the portrait, shuddering as he glanced at it. How horrible, he murmured to himself. And he walked across to the window and opened it. When he stepped out onto the grass, he drew a deep breath. The fresh morning air seemed to drive away all his sombre passions. He thought only of Sibyl. A faint echo of his love came back to him. He repeated her name over and over again. The birds that were singing in the dew-drenched garden seemed to be tilling the flowers. About her. To be continued.